Welcome to section 10 of the parasites. This is our overview figure showing the parasites you need to know for step one. In this lecture, we will be talking about Lishmania Donovani, which you can see right here. Our story takes place in a distant galaxy forever ago. This particular area of the desert is dominated by this leashed maniac. Look at him in this pit with that leash around his neck. He was tied to this leash a long time ago by the sand people and was just left here. It turns out that the maniac survived. Anyways, Leashed Maniac stands for Leashmania Donovani. Here's one of the sand people jumping off of this cliff edge. Look at him flying through the air. Well, this sand guy flying in the air represents the sandfly, which is what transmits Leashmania Donovani. The sandfly transmits Leashmania through their bites. To help you remember this, look at this poor guy getting bitten to pieces by this sand guy on the ground. These bites are painful, leading to skin ulcers. Here's a picture of an ulcer created by a sandfly bite. Again, this is a painful bite, as you can probably tell by looking at this picture. Now these painful ulcers are termed cutaneous leishmaniasis. You can tell this man is covered in skin wounds, so you should be able to remember that this man has cutaneous leishmaniasis. If a patient's immune system is weaker for some reason, they are more prone to developing visceral leishmaniasis. We represent this idea down here in the pit. It looks like a human sand person skirmish has led to them falling in the leashed maniac's pit. And this pit is full of sharp objects used to kill any intruders. As you can see, both of these people, the human and the sand person, have been impaled through their viscera, killing them. In addition to keeping spikes all over his pit, the leashed maniac likes to keep the place warm with heated lamps. The spikes and heat lamps together represent spiking fevers. The name is intuitive, but just so you're clear, this means that a patient's temperature can rise sharply, spiking, and then return to normal pretty quick. This can happen again and again in patients with visceral leishmaniasis. Visceral leishmaniasis can also cause splenomegaly. To help you remember this, we have a bunch of spleens resting on these spikes. The maniac doesn't eat the spleens. Instead, he leaves them on the spikes, collecting them over time. Being left in the hot sun causes them to balloon up. So ballooning and large spleens stands for splenomegaly. These human travelers had a Dalmatian dog with them. Unfortunately, the dog ran off and fell in this pit a while ago. As you can see, the dog's quite bloated, indicating he's been dead for a while. Well, that liver-spotted dog bloating in the pit represents liver enlargement. So between the bloating spleens and the bloated liver-spotted Dalmatian, you should be able to remember hepatosplenomegaly in visceral leishmaniasis. The leashed maniac has survived a long time by eating things he cooks, anything that he can scrounge up from passing travelers. Apparently, even things that aren't actually food. I mean, look at him fry up that bag of balloons. We like to use balloons to represent blood cells. For example, red balloons represent red blood cells. In this case, you can see the balloons of all colors deflated and useless. This represents pancytopenia, a decrease in all types of red blood cells. In fact, this pancytopenia is so deadly that we added this skeleton over here to reinforce the danger. 90% of all people with visceral leishmaniasis will die because of this severe pancytopenia. Now you can see this traveler has set up a little camp over here, just outside the pit. After his comrades died, he did what he could to survive in the desert. Instead of eating random things like balloons, like the leash maniac, he's just trying to ration his protein drink supply to stay alive. Well, these protein drinks represent protozoa, the group to which Leishmania Donovani belongs. And this particular protozoa has a particular form in its life cycle called an amastigoat. This can be visualized on peripheral blood smear for diagnosis. To help you remember this, we have this goat. Freaked out by all the violence around, this goat ran underneath the guy's clothesline and got its face covered by one of the pieces of clothing. Now it's kind of like a masked goat. A masked goat sounds like a masked goat. Also notice that this masked goat has unwittingly walked into the pit and is now traipsing around in the pool of fresh blood. This represents a peripheral blood smear. So putting these ideas together should help you remember that a masked goat will be seen on a peripheral blood smear. Here is a histological image showing a peripheral blood smear. And these are macrophages. And each macrophage contains several little amastigotes. Look at all those. They're everywhere. Now look at this traveler fight back against this sand guy. He's spraying glue in its eye. Naturally, the glue will cause a sty in the sand person's eye. And the idea of sty and glue represents styboglucanate, which is an effective treatment for both cutaneous and visceral leishmaniasis. This other traveler brought a bunch of amphibians on his journey. I think he was trying to see if they'd survive in the desert. In any case, they got loose, and thank goodness. Look at all those amphibious frogs swarm the sand person. Apparently, they see the sand person as some sort of threat, which is a pretty insightful conclusion for an amphibian. Anyways, we like to use amphibians to represent amphotericin B, another effective treatment for either form of leishmaniasis. And now that we've covered the image, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. A 23-year-old male presents with a red sore on his left calf that he first noticed three days ago. Last week, he returned from a trip to Ethiopia and recalls being bitten by a fly during his stay. He denies fevers or abdominal pain. 
An abdominal exam reveals no palpable organomegaly. The physician orders a peripheral blood smear, which reports the presence of multiple amastigotes found in macrophages. Based on these findings, which of the following insects most likely bit the patient? Hopefully you noticed that this patient was bitten by a fly in a foreign country and developed a red sore afterwards. This is very nonspecific. In fact, the best clue guiding what we are dealing with is this blood smear showing amastigotes within the macrophages. This should make you think of Leishmania donovani. And what fly transmits this parasite? Choice A, the sandfly. Remember, we have a masked goat running around on the blood. This is to help you remember amastigotes on blood smear. And also remember that sand person flying through the air represents the sandfly, which transmits this disease. And based on his presentation, he has the relatively milder form of the disease, cutaneous leishmaniasis. After all, he has no fevers, no evidence of hepatosplenomegaly, and no evidence of pancytopenia. Now choice B and C are wrong because they both transmit loa loa, which is a nematode, and loa loa does not fit this patient's presentation. Finally, choice D is wrong because the tsetse fly transmits trypanosoma brucei, gambians, and rhodesians, which cause African sleeping sickness. In our story of African sleeping sickness, with the trypanosome brucei, gambians, and rhodesians, we have goats tripping down a hill and spilling their own blood in the process to help you remember that peripheral blood smears in that disease would show tripomastigotes, not amastigotes, as in this patient with cutaneous leishmaniasis. And that should be all you need to know about Leishmania donovani.